Thanks very much for staying with us. Thanks uh, very much. It's, I'm Georgia Callan-Smith, and this is Eye on Africa. Uh, headlines tonight, the family of an assassinated Congolese opposition politician can finally lay him to rest. Cherubin Okende's body's finally been released back to his loved ones, but they say authorities aren't doing enough to investigate his killing last year. Also, this April will commemorate the 30th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide against the Tutsis. Preparation for the painful landmark is already underway. And as part of that, key military figures are honoured in a special ceremony. Our correspondents report. And Kenyan caregivers get support from an organisation offering training for families where the cost of accessing official health systems is prohibitive. Low-income households get shown how to provide for the basic needs of those needing help. But first, in DR Congo, the family of an assassinated former transport minister and opposition politician have finally taken possession of his body six months after he was killed. Cherubin Okende was a close ally of opposition politician Moise Katumbi. He was gunned down in Kinshasa last July, and although authorities held on to his remains pending a probe, his family say that they're still no closer to the truth about who was responsible for his murder. The family of Cherubin Okende would at last be able to mourn their loss. A public prosecutor in Kinshasa has permitted his family to remove Okende's body from the morgue in order to be buried. This decision has been made over six months after Okende was murdered, in circumstances that remain very murky. The opposition politician's dead body was found in his car, riddled with bullets, in central Kinshasa on July 13th. Since then, a formal investigation has been launched, but the lawyer representing Okende's family says the investigation is stalling and that he has yet to receive an official autopsy report. La famille est fatiguée. Le deuil est tellement prolongé. The family is tired. This has been dragged out so much that the family has understood that there will be no justice from the Congolese state. And the public prosecutor's office doesn't want to cooperate with the family in getting to the truth. The public prosecutor's office seems to be relying on the autopsy report, which is really the second part of the investigation, because for the family, the most important thing is to know who killed him and why. Okende's family is hoping to take his case to international courts in an effort to get to the bottom of the killing. According to their lawyer, the former politician's body will be laid to rest within the next few days. The Congolese authorities, for their part, had earlier encouraged the judiciary to conduct a meticulous investigation in order to shed light on the circumstances of Akende's death and to punish those responsible. The governor of the Nigerian state of Zamfara has inaugurated 2,645 civilians into a vigilante force meant to help combat criminal gangs in the country's northwest. Such vigilante outfits had previously been outlawed because of concerns that they just made the cycles of violence worse, accused of extrajudicial killings and tit-for-tat slaughter. Authorities say that the new Zamfara state community protection guards have been properly trained over two months. Many of the gangs behind attacks in the area camp in forests around Zamfara. The banditry contributes to a complex landscape of insecurity across Nigeria. A new three-year prison term was handed down to the jailed leader of Tunisian opposition party in Nahda. The sentence was given, the, given to Rashid Hanoushi for illegally financing uh, his party. The 83-year-old rival to President Kai Saeed is already serving a 15-month term over terror charges. He was arrested last April after criticizing the shrinking space in the country for, political, for expression of political views. In South Africa, the man who has confessed to starting one of the country's most deadly blazers has dropped his bid for bail. Sitembisu Medla Lose has been charged with 76 murders. The fire destroyed an abandoned building in Johannesburg last August. Dozens of families had been living there at the time. Medla Lose came forward saying that he was racked by guilt. He claims he set the fire to cover up a gangland murder. His case has been adjourned until March, whilst an investigation continues. Now, this April will commemorate the 30th anniversary of Rwanda's genocide against the Tutsis. Preparation for that painful landmark are already underway. And as part of that, key military figures are honoured in a special ceremony. That's where our Clement de Roma was. He sent us this report from Kigali. 
Every 1st of February since uh, 1994, the year of the Rwandan Patriotic Front taking power and the end of the genocide against the Tutsis, Rwanda celebrates its heroes in a simple ceremony. Some uh, personalities designated as heroes are fighters, such as uh, Major General Fred Regema, a founding member of the EPF and the first commander to fall in 1990 during the party's first offensive. But not all uh, heroes are necessarily military. The second to last king of Rwanda was also are designated as such, as well as former as students who rejected ethnic divisions in the country. According to the office in charge of the ceremony, Rwanda even celebrated its heroes before gaining independence. Rwanda so it necessary that there is a need to also come back to the uh, that heritage of heroism in Rwanda. So they started this celebration of National Heroes Day after 1994 genocide against Tutsi. Here in Rwanda, the, to become a hero, it is not the discipline, or domain. It can be politician, it can be economist, it can be either social, political, or what, and the military. Only the president of the Republic, Paul Kagame, is authorized to award the medals that uh, designate heroes in different categories. The entire country is also uh, preparing for the 30th commemoration of the genocide, a period called Kwibuka, or to remember in Kenya, Rwanda, supposed to start in two months. The government has already announced a program of intergenerational dialogues that will take place before the April 7th national ceremony. Clément, the aroma there for us in Rwanda. Now, a 2019 bilateral, bilateral military agreement between Rwanda and Central African Republic has led to a deepening of economic ties as well between the countries. Increasingly, Rwandan investors are turning towards CAR, looking for opportunities, especially in construction, mining or agriculture. Our team had a look and sent us this report. The large property under construction near the Mara, an hour's drive from Bangui, belongs to a Rwandan businessman. He owns a local supermarket chain and textile factories in China. The businessman, a former minister, claims to own 40,000 hectares of land in the Central African Republic. With no water or electricity, he cleared the land and imported farming equipment from Germany, hoping to farm fruit in five years. Look, in the, the whole world, for the businessman, is trying. I come here for the trying. Maybe I win, maybe I lose. That is a, the, the world, world is like that. The Central African government has allocated over 70,000 hectares to Rwandan entrepreneurs. With Rwanda Air offering direct flights to Kigale, more than 700 businessmen have settled in Bangui since 2021, some of whom are trying their luck in the construction sector. The renovation of this basketball court is in the hands of a Rwandan entrepreneur who won the tender by the Ministry of Sports. Yeah, I will stay here because I have also many projects here. And uh, from this one, I've seen many opportunities. Maybe I think we are going to, go, uh, to get another project here. Following the 2019 bilateral military agreement, investment deals between Bangui and Kigali have multiplied. For this minister, who is the architect of the partnership, the South-South Corporation must be strengthened. Several economic agreements have been signed in both the mining and agricultural sectors. And today, several Central African players have gone to invest in Rwanda and other Rwandan players have come to invest here in the Central African Republic. Now, the volume of investment is estimated at around $250 million. Rwandan investors feel safe in Bangui as 1,200 Rwandan troops have been deployed to protect civilians. Their mission is also to protect President Tawadera along with his Russian allies. Now to Kenya, where healthcare can be expensive and often beyond the budgets of low-income households. One of the initiative, though, is trying to better prepare home carers to look after their loved ones by offering training that they hope can reduce hospital visits and so costs. Clarice Fortuné tells us more. Checking the blood pressure, giving a finger prick blood test, simple medical acts that this nurse is showing to her patient's daughter who suffers from dementia, hypertension and diabetes. We train the relative who is willing to become the primary caregiver on how to go about the patient's lives, like taking vital signs, that is blood pressure, temperature and pulse. We also advise them about the diets and 
what to look out for in the patient. Her visit is part of a scheme to train up family caregivers to look after a loved one in need of long-term health care. A more affordable alternative to hospital stays, which costs on average $150 a day. Now Monari is behind this initiative that helps low-income families access health care more easily. What we have been doing for five years now is to lower the costs of health care for chronically ill patients and their families. And how we have been able to achieve this is by building a large network of healthcare workers and then connecting them to uh, patients' homes so that they can provide affordable clinical and supportive care at the comfort of the patient's own home. And uh, we also understand that it's not exactly uh, sustainable for other families uh, who live uh, in under a dollar a day. If the patient's medical need is important, the nurses can visit the home daily. But after they have stabilized the patient and trained the primary caregiver, they then come once a week. A reprieve for those in Kenya who have to spend the biggest part of their household income on health. Well, that's it for Eye on Africa for now. Thanks for joining us, though. Do so again if you can. Till then, take care.